I would like to welcome my very special guest, Silesh Rao. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk with me today, Silesh. It's really, really appreciated. So thank you very mm. much. I recently read uh, a book by Glenn Merzer called Food is Climate. Um, and because of that book and the, the facts that I, I was um, presented with in the book, uh, I wanted to speak with you and try and uh, get some more information from you. So do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your history? Sure. So I'm a systems engineer by profession. And um, I used to work on the internet. Uh, I did my PhD in Stanford University, California. And I started working on the internet uh, in 1985. And I spent 20 years um, working on the hardware infrastructure for the internet. Um, and then I happened to see Al Gore's presentation on TV. And I was so shocked. I said to my wife, if half of what he's saying is true, I feel like I'm wasting my time. Mm -hmm. So I decided to look into it. And I realized it's actually far worse than what he's saying. So I closed my company and I started focusing on the environment full time mm -hmm. in 2006. Right. Well, th thank you for, for doing that. I mean, I actually had the same, it was the Al Gore, Al Gore's movie that got me into it as well. And mm -hmm. of course, the same as you, that's kind of like an introduction. And then the more you learn is like, wow, oh, wow, it's actually, you, you know, they're not telling us the complete yeah, right. truth here. Right. And uh, right. so, I mean, obviously, so that's what got you in, in interested in, in uh, these crises uh, that we're facing at the moment. Right. So just, to let people know, I think in Japan, um, I'm not sure if you saw the re research out of Pew uh, last week, it was uh, about um, uh, people's beliefs in various countries about the climate crisis. And Japan uh, was the only country in, uh, only developed country where people's, uh, people are less uh, worried about climate change now than they were in 2015. So they seem mm. to be going backwards here. So just for, for the Japanese audience, could you, uh, just describe some of the impacts that we are going to face should we not take uh, immediate action regarding the combined threats that we face. Yeah, uh, what you will notice is uh, that uh, year after year, reality is actually outpacing mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, models are saying, you know, this is the range of temperature increase you can expect. And reality is actually above that. Mm -hmm. And um, so every year is getting hotter and hotter. Uh, Siberia just experienced 118 degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, almost 50 degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. which, uh, which is definitely going to melt the <laughs> permafrost. Right, right. You do yes, that. Yeah. And, uh, and that's not in any model. You know, mm -hmm. no model ever predicts that. Mm -hmm. So you ask, why is it that? that reality is outpacing models, it turns out that there are nonlinear feedback phen phenomena that are being triggered, mm -hmm. okay? And they're all going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So it's literally like, you know, we are rolling down a hill and we are then going to fall off the cliff. And so uh, uh, when, when you are facing a situation like that, you should be trying to cling to anything that's there and trying to work a way up. Right. and not fall off the cliff. This is why I say it's a very urgent issue. Climate, mm -hmm. climate change is a very urgent issue, much more urgent than what anyone is telling us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, because I used to study nonlinear feedback systems mm -hmm. and, um, and I used to study them on, on electronic circuits, you know, nonlinear feedback on electronic circuits. Mm -hmm. I know that when you start dialing up the voltage and you see nonlinear phenomenon taking hold, it's important for you to dial down right away. Right, right, right. Because if you keep going, it actually goes to another state. Mm -hmm. And then to get from that state back to the original state, you actually have to dial it down way below mm -hmm. the voltage where it did that transformation. Right. So this is called hysteresis in nonlinear feedback systems. And typically you will have hysteresis when you have um, cubic nonlinearities or, you know, odd nonlinearities. And uh, what is happening in the Arctic to me is, uh, is very much um, an example of nonlinear feedback, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the Arctic is melting. And 
when the Arctic fully melts, if the Arctic uh, Ocean becomes blue, that will absorb more energy from the sun right. than all the energy that's being stored from all the greenhouse gases we've emitted. Mm -hmm. So literally, we're going to double the heating right, right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, right away. And the Arctic is on track to melt within the next few years. Mm -hmm. It's getting thinner and thinner. You can see the trend in the ice. You can see how it's going to go. Now, once the Arctic melts, it's, it's much harder to refreeze it. <laughs> you have to make it much, much colder than it was right. in order to refreeze it. So mm -hmm. this is why I say that don't play with nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, please don't play with this one, especially the climate system. Mm -hmm. Because we um, depend on it for our lives. And uh, potentially, you know, the, uh, the amount of carbon that's under the permafrost, we have added 1 trillion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere mm -hmm. um, since the Industrial Revolution began. Mm -hmm. so, so when you, you said uh, a thousand tons has gone into the atmosphere and most of that has gone, has been uh, absorbed in the ocean, oceans, is that correct? Is that correct? Well, the, the one trillion tons is what is left in the atmosphere. We actually put about two trillion tons into the atmosphere. Half oh, of really? it has been absorbed by the ocean and, and on land. Okay. Mm. So roughly half has been absorbed by uh, ocean and land, half is still there in the atmosphere. So if you right. just calculate, you know, we went from 280 parts per million to 412 parts per million. That's about 1 trillion tons of CO2 because it's 7.8 tons of CO2 per part per million. Right. Right. You can calculate. So di when, when you're talking about dialing back uh, in a non-linear system, then you'd be talking about dialing back to 350 parts per million of carbon right. in the atmosphere, right? Right. right. Yeah. At I least mean, you'd need to bring it down as quickly as possible. Yeah. And then what, what would be the consequences of, for example, uh, runaway uh, emissions of methane from under the, the carbon, uh, um, under the tundra? Well, uh, the consequences of that is it's going to heat up the coldest part of the earth. And this is typically, you know, um, typically when you, when you start trapping more and more energy, more and more heat in the atmosphere, the coldest part heats up faster than the hotter parts, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is, because it, uh, it's already, you know, seeing a huge difference in temperature. Mm -hmm. So this is where the Arctic is heating up at twice the rate right. as right. The, um, the rest of the, uh, the, as the average, right? And so if we let runaway climate change happen, there is a potential, there is a non-zero probability of all the carbon showing up in the atmosphere, hmm. okay? Just getting released and up into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, that's called the Venus syndrome. And the Venus syndrome, in Venus, the, the surface temperature is 450 degrees Celsius mm -hmm. of Venus. So um, life will die, right? So um, now, to me, it doesn't matter if, you know, if we die and then it doesn't matter that life is going <laughs> to, because we are dead. So it doesn't matter. Right. right. right? But it'll be such a shame that we wiped out all life. Right. <laughs> because, I mean, yeah, it's, it means, because, you know, a th 13, you know, uh, billion year experiment, essentially, like four and a half billion <clears throat> years to, to get to where we are today and to wipe it out knowingly would just be absolute insanity right i mean it would be right uh, incredible but um and, and obviously a lot of people like to say they say oh well it's okay if we die we die you know whatever but it's it's not like it's going to be you know a flick of a switch and we all die i mean it's it's mass starvation right it's uh, right. it's conflict it's people fighting each other for scarce resources and our generation, which is, has grown up with everything, right? We've never mm -hmm. needed for anything. We're really not equipped for this, right? We, especially right. those of us in the, in the, in the, the richer nations, right? We, right? we haven't faced any kind of hardships, you know? It's going to be, this is not something I think, you know, people joke about it, but it's not something really uh, people want to be joking about, right? It's not something right. that's funny uh, 
as I said, it's, it's not a flicking of the switch. It's going to be a, a long, right. drawn-out uh, process. But again, why do it, right? Especially when they see a way out, right? There is a way out. Yeah. Which yeah. is uh, treat, start treating life. See, right now we have a system hmm. of normalized violence. Right, yes. Okay, where we are basically showing the animals who's more powerful than them. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a dominion, right? So it's domination of animals. Sure. So you can see that in the in, in all the games we play also. If you think about the games we play, tennis balls. Tennis balls are covered with wool. So we are mm. banging wool around. So telling the sheep, hey, look who's the boss. Um, you see baseball. Baseball is covered in cow leather, cow hide. Right. So we are our, um, our horse hide. And so we are hitting that showing the horses and the cows who's boss around here. Mm. And we do that with cricket. I mean, that's also cow hide. Right. Uh, football. I mean, you, you look at all our games. They're all competitive games. And we are starting off by showing to each other, hey, we are so much more superior than animals. Mm. It's mm. about showing off, right? right? Our superiority, our power and superiority over animals. And the animals are probably looking at us saying, what the heck is wrong with this species? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean I guess, so i guess this this is what you're getting at with your your two books uh, just in case anyone doesn't know you've you've written two books the carbon dharma the occupation of butterflies and carbon yoga the vegan metamorphosis right and in and also at your work at climate healers i guess uh, mm -hmm. what you're getting at is that this now that we're this narcissistic predatory taker species which i think you mm -hmm. you've said and mm -hmm. that we need to transform into a Homo ahimsa species. So, right. so this new species that you would like to see, and I think I would like to see, and I, I would argue the vast majority of us would like to see it, right? If you ask mm. anybody, what do you, what's your dream? What do you, what's your hope? What do mm. you wish? They usually say peace, right? Okay. So to you and me, maybe when people say peace, their idea of peace is slightly different to ours. So for you, for you, what, what, what do you mean by that? A Himsa species, a Homo Himsa species. Yeah, so I'm saying we are um, a Homo Himsa. So we call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens, which which translates to the wise wise hominid. <laughs> right, you know? right. I mean, in yeah. in uh, Latin, hmm. and um, and I've never met a truly wise person going around saying, "Look at me, I'm so wise." You know, and that too yeah. twice. Right. I mean, it's yeah. <laughs> wise, it's wise. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why I say we are a narcissistic, predatory taker species, mm -hmm. because we play a game. In the 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 way we have constructed the game of money, mm. right? It's all about who's taking the most. So we value those who have taken the most. And 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 it's um, it's basically a competition as to who is taking the most. And so those who are running the game have obviously, you know, stacked it in their favor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yes, yes, yes. and those who, who don't have anything, you know, who are being sucked into the game because they're indigenous people who never even, you know, heard of money before. Mm -hmm. We go and burn down their forests mm -hmm. saying we need it. We right. need it. Why? Because yeah. we need it for our economy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mostly, it's, mostly it's for our food. Mm. You know, we need to burn down the forest in order to raise animals in order to eat them. Okay, mm. that's what we're doing. So we tell mm. them, you know, you, your way of life is inferior to ours. You have to make room for us. That's called colonialism, mm. right? Yeah, sure. And then, so then we take it from them, and then we tell them, you start from the bottom of the mm. game. Mm. You start with zero, mm -hmm. and you work your way up. Mm. And then we tell them, you too can be Bill Gates if you work hard enough, <laughs> which is an outright lie. Okay? Sure. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it's, well, it's, it's obviously not sustainable. Right? If everybody <laughs> is trying to be Bill Gates and have all these massive American style houses, of course, it's, it's just not possible. Right. The whole right. game is the whole game is not possible. It's not sustainable. And I mean, yeah. it, it's structural violence, I guess, is a, is a way of looking at that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. forcing countries to open their economies to you, to let their banks in, unless you let their bank, their financial institutions in, then you won't give them loans and all the rest right. of it. The IMF, the World Bank, I mean, it's all all part of this a colonial project, right, that is ongoing right. and uh, 
it's I, I guess yeah I mean it's, it's a hard ask to try and change this species right and I guess that's something that interests me about you is mm -hmm. I also do believe that change is going to come from the grassroots mm -hmm. I don't think change uh, has ever come from above right it always comes from the grassroots yes governments might make decisions but they always do that when they're forced to by right. by uh, people so you're saying that with or without government cooperation that we can do this which is basically the opposite of what we're being told right that there's no right. point in individuals doing anything individuals can't affect change everything has to come from the government and right. therefore everybody then feels so just you know they're so uh um powerless right that they can't do anything mm -hmm. it's a well it's got to be coming from the government but that's really the, the those with power are basically lying to us right so that exactly. we don't get together and affect that change yeah. um so how do you respond to those people who say that you know behavior change is a waste of time because they seem to be quite plentiful at the moment so individual change is critical mm -hmm. to uh systemic change because it's a it's a two-way feedback process so individual change drives system change which drives individual change and and so on if this is how we create a um a virtuous cycle that grows and grows and then eventually then the governments have no choice but to come along mm -hmm. <laughs> think about how gandhi um got independence in india right. okay mm -hmm. he went and asked the british hey please leave india and they said no we're not leaving this is our country <laughs> mm -hmm. so he said okay we are going to we are going to address the largest industry in england at this time mm -hmm. which in the 1900s was the textile industry right yeah he said okay we are going to change our clothes from british clothes to clothes homespun in india mm -hmm. called khadi clothes so he started the khadi movement in 1919 and within 12 years so by 1930 180 million indians no longer bought british clothes mm -hmm. okay and they were only wearing khadi clothes why mm -hmm. because they could see each other wearing khadi clothes mm -hmm. and saying hi you are part of the movement right now yeah, yeah, yeah. okay uh, we are together fighting the british okay so mm -hmm. so they did that so this consumer movement that he created forced the british government to negotiate with gandhi mm -hmm. until then they didn't even bother negotiating they were throwing him in jail So if you look at history mm -hmm. it was the grassroots change the individual mm -hmm. change that forced systemic change mm -hmm. so that forced the british government to at least make a pretense of giving independence to india okay mm -hmm. of course colonialism still continued through the through the currency system the currency mm -hmm. mechanism but uh, at least you know physically it was no longer a colonized country so uh, it was ruled by indians but who had to then get foreign exchange and then therefore they were still colonized they didn't realize that okay right yes 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 it's yeah. A, yeah, continue so but now we are seeing through the entire game we are seeing through the entire game because we now have all the data you know thanks to the internet you know thanks to um uh people who have written books that we can all read mm -hmm. so thanks to the spread of knowledge we are beginning to see how this ecological ponzi scheme mm -hmm. has been running in yeah. the world right mm -hmm. it's a ecological ponzi scheme because mm -hmm. nature has been giving 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 so we keep taking from nature mm -hmm. and then we recruit more and more people to come and take from nature in order to funnel wealth to a few yes yes i mean so that's the they, ecological yeah. ponzi scheme that's been going on and right. all ponzi schemes depend on growth yes 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 as soon as the scheme cannot grow anymore it collapses mm -hmm. right which is why we are now in the state of i i say we have we have moved past the caterpillar stage and we are now in the chrysalis mm. because now all growth is actually pretend growth there is really no growth happening <laughs> we are pretending yeah. to grow by by <laughs> using currency mechanisms <laughs> well i mean yeah i mean basically in the 1970s i mean I, i'm from wales in the uk and uh, in the 1970s one parent needed to work right and we could have a decent life now to have that same life both parents have to work right? right and both and now we do have more money coming in but both parents are working and people don't really seem to see that that actually nothing has gotten better since right. the 70s right i mean yes right. uh, certainly post second world war things did improve 
uh, well, when I mean, obviously ecologically they didn't improve, um, but yeah. that was all playing out in the background. People weren't paying attention to it because their salaries were going up and they were, you know, having this increase in in the uh, in conveniences, I guess, right? Right. But, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly ended now, and uh, and now it's just all all you can see is the ecological collapse. Right. That that was happening all the time, right? It was always right. there. It just we weren't paying attention to it. Um, so I think the, the grassroots uh, change that you're talking about, I think it's, I'm sure it can happen everywhere, but Japan is a slightly different country that here um, Japanese people don't like to uh, look different to anybody else. They all like mm -hmm. to kind of follow each other and they tend to follow uh, government advice. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is problematic for a grassroots uh, movement. However, mm. it, it does offer the possibility of sudden change. Should the government decide to encourage plant-based living, for example, or, or something else, then very quickly, I think the population will will um, get behind that. So mm. what, with this in mind, what would be your advice to activists in Japan? Uh, I tell them, I mean, I would tell any activist anywhere mm. to keep at it. No matter where you are, you're making a contribution. Mm -hmm. No matter where you are, you're making right. a contribution. Yeah. And you are part of the movement, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So I say that, think about what happened in COVID, right? The COVID-19. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And we, uh, to prevent COVID-19 from spreading, we had to do social distancing. And so we were trying to minimize mm -hmm. the, the in interaction between us, right? Now, to maximize vegan spread, mm. you have to minimize social distance. So you have to really go and tell people. You know, you yes, have to yes. talk more and more. You have to communicate more and more. Because veganism is also an infection. Mm. You, can, you can model it as exactly that. Okay, It's just yeah. like um, any other pandemic. Veganism is a pandemic, but it is a good pandemic. A good one. Perhaps. <laughs> it's good to add, yes. Yeah. But the, the models are the same. Mm -hmm. So we need to minimize... Uh, minimize the recidivism. Right. And it's, it's again, it's the, the butterfly effect, right? The, right. Just fla keep flapping your wings and somewhere you, you don't, you won't know it, but somewhere down the line, some you'll be having an impact on someone. Right. And it's, uh, right. yeah. So I, okay. Um, okay. So uh, another kind of, uh, I suppose, Japan centric question, but so many in the Western nations uh, believe that we've always eaten this meat centric mm -hmm. diet, right? That it's, mm -hmm. it's always, being the caveman food that we 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 got our big brains from and uh, and, right. and we we still use this today as a justification right for continuing right. this tradition even even when we can see the damage it's doing that the amazon is on fire and uh, etc right. but obviously this isn't the case right for large sections of the population of the human population mm -hmm. that they, they didn't eat meat or they haven't eaten meat for thousands of years right. and and i believe that you're a brahmin right Mm -hmm. Or you brought yes. up a Brahmin? Can you tell us a little bit about, about being brought up as a Brahmin in, in India? Yeah, I, so I was brought up as a Brahmin, and uh, basically we didn't eat any animal foods, any meat, um, but we did consume dairy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, but that was rare. When I was growing up, it was rare. Really? Dairy really? was something that you got when you went to your grandmother's place because oh. they had a cow. But oh, in the oh. city, it was hard to get. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Um, we had, in fact, milk was rationed in India at that wow. time, right? Okay. And, um, but then over time, it became more and more common. Now, India is the largest producer of milk in the world. Right. And that comes from the fact that the Dairy Development Board has now uh, created a, a distribution mechanism for taking milk from the villages into the cities. Mm -hmm. Okay, with refrigerated uh, trucks. Mm -hmm. Now, what that did was it allowed the villagers to pillage the forest faster mm -hmm. and convert that into milk and sell it. Mm -hmm. So the forests are dying faster mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as a result of that. So if you look at the India's, India's forest cover, it's abysmal now you know, compared to what it used to be when I was growing up. Right? Wow. So wow. it turns out that uh, carnism or the consumption of animal products is actually the foundation of colonialism. Mm. Okay. If you think about who really needed to eat animals, mm. it is 
Western nations, the, go the global north, because they really didn't have too many tropical fruits available all the time. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So they had to eat animals, right? Mm -hmm. So when that culture gets spread throughout the world, that's colonialism. Mm -hmm. right? So we are being slowly weaned away from our culture and made to eat foods that are really foreign to us, like hamburgers and pizza and things like that. We never really ate that when I was growing up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, obviously, I'm in Japan, and uh, so I teach at a school, and uh, every day the kids are drinking milk, right? And you, it's like 90 90 percent of Asians are lactose intolerant, right? I mean, that should be uh, telling you it's like we're not supposed to be putting this stuff in our mouths, right? Yes. I mean, uh, in the the Western nations, the Europeans. They've been doing it for so many thousands of years that they've become, you know, they've built up a tolerance to it. But I mean, the word intolerant, it means, you know, this is not something we're supposed to be uh, okay. consuming. But I mean, it's, uh, it, as you say, it's going global, right? It's it's just going everywhere. And uh, yeah, it, yeah. And and uh, again, it's it's just obviously not sustainable for us to keep going down that. Uh, right. That, that, so uh, there's a lot of money to be made in colonizing the bodies of people. <laughs> and making them eat bad food so that they get mm. sick. Right. And then yeah. you can feed them pharmaceuticals. Mm. Because if you think about pharmaceuticals, you know, mm. um, the vast majority of pharmaceuticals are consumed by Western. Um, I think about half or half of the pharmaceuticals are consumed by the Americans or something like that. In some mm. phenomenal amount, right? Would make sense. And yeah. so the pharmaceutical companies are saying, hey, if we could get everybody to consume pharmaceuticals like the Americans do, Mm. Look at our market. It's going to be huge. Mm. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? Well, you have to make everybody get diabetes, everybody get heart disease, everybody get cancer, mm. because then they'll be on pharmaceuticals. And you know, chronic diseases are cash cows for pharmaceuticals. Right. right? Yes. So it's working. And so this is colonizing the bodies of people mm. and turning that into a money-making venture. Mm. And that's what uh, drives this growth. Okay. Uh, but it's not growth that's good for us. Okay. So would you, I mean, using India as a case study, do you, mm -hmm. most Japanese think that they need to eat meat for protein. They have to have mm -hmm. milk for calcium, right? So most of the hin Hindus in in uh, India, they're not dying of uh, kwashiorkor, right? Of protein <laughs> deficiency. Is, right. is it, does that ever happen to Indians no. that, that, that have food? Well, that Indians if, have enough food. If they, if they have enough food, you don't die of protein deficiency. Right. People right. are dying of starvation. Right. Die of quashiorkor right. protein yeah. deficiency. Right. Yeah. 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 And That's... obviously Indians were drinking, you say a little bit of milk, and now they're drinking mm -hmm. a lot of milk, right? Right. Um, yeah. Are there any health uh, impacts of that that are noticeable in India? Absolutely. So you saw that happen within 20, 30 years. You saw this huge rise in diabetes huge rise in heart disease and um, cancer um, so and obesity. You, know, mm. you saw that. I mean, when I was growing up, uh, obesity was almost unknown in India. Mm. And now mm. obesity is common. You know? mm. So you can see that people are becoming unhealthy. And fortunately, it happened so fast that people are noticing it. Mm, Whereas okay. if it happens very slowly, people yes. don't even notice it. You yeah, know. I mean, that, that seemed to be a, follow, a similar trend definitely to Japan, right? I mean, they had very little obesity and that's, uh, there's a, a lot of obese people now and obviously the cancers uh, numbers are going up as well and uh, mm. heart disease. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely a trend that seems to be coming from that dietary change that they're undergoing. Um, right. So we're going to get into a little bit of uh, about your recent background now. So I think you were an executive producer on Cowspiracy, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Also, well, thank you very much because that movie was uh, what was the catalyst for my wife and I uh, becoming vegan. We were pescatarian at the time and then mm. we watched this, were blown away by some of the facts in it, started doing the research and we were just genuinely shocked. But at the same time, after watching that movie, I was extremely hopeful, Silesh, mm. so hopeful. I, I remember just leaving I'd, I'd been so i just i felt helpless until watching mm. that movie and then all of a sudden it was oh okay we can do something about this right and then i mm. unfortunately started talking to people and uh, they weren't <laughs> as willing to change as i was so that brought me back down to earth but 
one of the uh, the facts that you um, that 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 is in the movie is that that paper that was written by Goodland and Anang uh, in two thousand and nine, I believe, in World Watch, and it stated that at least at least fifty one percent of greenhouse gas emissions come from animal agriculture. Um, this obviously is an incredible, incredibly high number. And it was startling even mm. more so because the, the mm. UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, at that time stated that 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions were attributed to animal agriculture. So right. in your opinion, could you explain how the FAO got this so wrong? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a question of what conventions you use. Mm. Okay. Because there are there is a lot of hum, human uh, greenhouse gas emissions happening, and there is a lot of sequestration happening because of human activities as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, you choose then you choose what do you count as human emissions, and what do you count as part of the natural cycle. Right. So there's something called natural cycle. See the uh, the CO two, carbon dioxide, is something that's exchanged between land, ocean, and the atmosphere every year, you know, in huge amounts, 20 times the fossil fuels. So we are putting about you know, 10 trillion tons of carbon, about, about uh, 40 trillion tons of CO2 from burning fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. But nature is doing about 800, 800 billion tons, no, 10 billion tons, sorry, 800 billion tons is what nature is doing, mm-hmm. okay, it's about 20 times okay, what we do with fossil fuels. Now, about two thirds of that used to be there in the uh, pre-industrial era. Mm-hmm. And one third is what we have added. Mm-hmm. Well, how did we do that? We use irrigation, we use poor fertilizers, that increases the, ex- the sequestration of CO2, okay? And then the vegetation dies. Mm-hmm. So we also then chop down, um, trees and we burn it. Mm. These are called pasture maintenance fires. Mm, mm. And all those things were not being counted. Mm. They were only counting the fossil fuels. <laughs> wow, wow. And they were counting a little bit of the land use change. Okay. Mm-hmm. So even though there's so much land use change emissions that are being done by human activities, like for instance, the pasture maintenance fires, uh, if you look at how much um, that's being done, mm. on 37% of the land area of the planet, any vegetation that is not eaten by our cows and sheep is cut and burnt every year. Mm-hmm. And that CO2 is not counted. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then you ask, why is it not counted? And it turns out that they're trying to tell a story of just fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like, you know, I don't want to keep saying there is 800, trillion, 800 billion tons of CO2 on which this 40 billion tons we are adding. And so we are now causing so much to go up and so much to come down. You know, it becomes cumbersome, right? To do the accounting that way. So you have to come up with conventions to simplify things. And that's what they did. But they simplified it to point you towards fossil fuels only. (laughs) Wow, Uh, okay. Um, So when you you see the true impact of animal agriculture, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is, I think it's, for anyone that's been looking at this for a number of years, as you as you have, right. and I, I also have, it's, I think we get it, right? But when people see this for the first time, it can be just, it's like a sledgehammer to the head, right? So, whoa, 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 this is, this is against everything that I've ever heard, right? right. How, yeah. how can this possibly be? And um, so what, what, I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, what, what, um, what what you've said, I think, in the past, you you've related this to, like, relying on their data, the FAO's data. Mm. Um, you you you're saying that it's because they they've um, in the past they've uh, they've um, joined alliances with, I think, the International Meat Secretariat and the International they still are. Federation. They, they still are today, right? So, right. so there's. Would you say that there's a vested interest? I mean, I I know I've seen you liken it to. A Philip Morris scientific paper that highlights the, <laughs> the cancer healing benefits of of smoking tobacco, right? So, I mean, right. <laughs> you still obviously I'm answering my own question here, but that seems to be a, a tiny little bit of a conflict of interest, right? 
It's a huge conflict of interest. Hmm. The FAO's numbers are clearly jiggered hmm. to make animal agriculture look less benign than hmm. it really is. Okay. Hmm. And it's jiggered. I mean, it is like telling the fox, you know, count the hens and tell me how many there are. <laughs> and uh, it just, I mean, I guess the, the overriding writing question I have here is just why? I mean, why, why would they be doing this, right? It's, I mean, why it's, are they doing this? It's because go side on a. Think about this, okay? Think about all the environmental problems on the planet. Okay? If you look at all the environmental problems on the planet, there is chemical pollution. It's plastic pollution, there is uh, aerosol loading, there is nitrogen loading, there's phosphorus loading, and, and then there is land use, there's water use, and all of them are, we have reached the limits. We mm. can't go any further, okay? And in fact, we have exceeded the limits. But we still and, need growth. Mm. Yeah. So why are they focusing just on climate change? Mm. See, why are all these other, other uh, all these environmental problems um, critical. They're all part of the emergency that we're facing. Why? Because they're all killing life. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, if you look at the biodiversity and how fast we're losing biodiversity, that is a leading indicator of the damage we're creating to the environment. Mm -hmm. And most of that is being caused by us eating animals. Right. Not by climate change yet. Okay, mm -hmm. Climate change is, going, is getting faster and faster, but it's not yeah. the one that's killing, the, leading the the killing of the planet. Well, I think I think the the World Wildlife Fund stated mm -hmm. that it's sixty percent of all extinctions are due to our uh, animal agriculture, right? Well, it yeah, that's about two thirds. Yeah, about uh, two thirds of it is from the uh, animal agriculture. But I, it is um, if you look at the rate at which we are killing wild animals, we are on track to wipe out almost a hundred percent of them by 2026. That's how mm -hmm. fast we are killing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, why are they focusing on climate change? That was my first question. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah because because uh, when they first started in 1992, they actually had three problems. They were looking at three problems. They found they formed three conventions: the Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN um, Convention to Combat Desertification. And then the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was the third one, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the first two, they came up with resolutions. We are going to stop biodiversity loss by 2010. <laughs> Everybody signed on to it. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. In fact, we were killing wild animals faster than mm -hmm. we were doing before when they, came, when they signed it. Nothing happened. So it was just pretend. They're pretending mm. to sign something and then pretending to work on it. They're mm. doing nothing yeah. about it. Okay? Mm. So then I said, why are they focusing on climate change? And then they de-emphasize those two conventions. Instead of meeting once a year, they're now meeting once every two years. Mm. As if we have solved the problem. Mm. <laughs> mm. Right? And none of those uh, uh, the, none of those goals were being met. Right. So right. I was curious. I'm a systems engineer. Okay? So I'm look, I look at things from a systems perspective. And I like to look at the holistic part. Mm -hmm. As a systems engineer, if I don't take care of every aspect of a problem, I'll never come up with a solution that works. Mm -hmm. Right. So when I was working on the internet, if I had said, oh, I'm going to ignore the effect of FM radio stations or AM radio stations because you know, that's not my problem. Someone else will figure this out. My stuff wouldn't have worked. Right. <laughs> 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 I would be getting people returning it to me, right? Saying, you know, it's not working, it's not working. So anyway, uh, so I tend to look at the holistic picture. Hmm. So I was wondering, why are they not looking at those things? And they're only focusing on climate change. And I noticed it's because they can sell more things. Hmm. They can make the economy grow by hmm. selling hmm. more solar panels, by yeah. selling more electric cars, because they were framing it. Hmm. They were framing it as hmm. the leading cause is fossil fuels. Mm, not mm, animal agriculture mm, mm. because all the other problems animal agriculture is clearly the leading right. cause well i mean right. it's, yeah <laughs> i mean even if you use the fao's uh, 2006 <laughs> figures it's still you know yeah. they we've got to change to electric cars and the cars are like what four or four percent of <laughs> emissions you know can, yeah. compared to 18 right so yeah i mean it, it doesn't yeah. make any sense does it to uh, and plus it costs a lot of money, right? As you say, and that's right. probably the, the reason why it costs a lot of money to change the entire infrastructure to 
right. have electric car, you know, powering stations and, and charging points, the rest of it. But yeah, I guess the point is you, you're making, you know, I've made it for you is that, yeah, that does, it does make a lot of money, doesn't it? Right. Um, so it's it's a people. systemic problem, right? So mm. when you have a systemic problem and you're in the, in this system, you're trying to figure out how to uh, take advantage in your, in, for yourself in that system. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit like, you know, if you go to a doctor right now with uh, diabetes, heart disease and cancer, and the doctor then starts prescribing, you know, uh, metformin for your diabetes and heart, you know, bi- triple bypass surgery for your heart disease mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then chemotherapy for your um, cancer, he's going to make a lot of money. Right. Right? <laughs> But if he mm. tells you, hey, go eat a whole food plant-based diet and you'll, mm. yeah, all these three things will reverse, I mean, you're not going to come back to him. Yeah. So yeah. the whole thing collapses, right? the mm. system collapses. So it's a different model altogether. Mm. So this is why I say, you know, we now have a system that is founded on carnism. It's founded mm. on exploitation, uh, mm. on being a taker species. And yes. then we're playing a game to see who has taken the most. Mm. And we value those who have taken the most. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yes, we yes, actually yes. put them up in a pedestal. So mm. look, he's a billionaire. Bill yeah. Gates, so look up to him, right? Because mm. he took mm. the most out right. of the planet. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we mm. are in awe of him by having With taken Jeff the most. Bezos and his rocket, right? I mean, <laughs> right. big shaped rocket. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we were taught to admire these people, right? Because they, exactly. they're winning, they're winning the game that we're playing, and the game that we're right. playing is essentially death. Right, it's it's yeah. uh, our own suicide, <laughs> and if you're yeah. winning, then you're you're causing that suicide quicker than the others, essentially, right? right? right. And um, right. yeah, rather than having der- you know deriding these people, we're actually applauding them and uh, clapping right. them on the back. Well done, well done for right. adding all this money to your bank account and polluting right. the world in the process. So well, it turns out that the architecture of the currency system itself mm. is forcing that. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because the currency system flows from the top down Mm -hmm. and there is no reason why it has to flow from the top down. It can flow from the bottom up too. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you think about how to architect the currency system, that is, that will help life thrive. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a systems problem. And so I say, okay, what kind of game should we be playing? Mm -hmm. Uh, How do we organize ourselves so that we routinely, we, you know, we lead a normal life. And the planet thrives around us. Mm, mm, See, we mm. need to get to a system like that. Otherwise, we are mm. dead. Mm. Okay? Yes, yes. Because if we keep d- playing this game, we are literally on, on track to figure out who's the ultimate winner and the rest are all dead. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and I guess, well, everyone uh, eventually, right? It's not like a lot of the billionaires seem to be buying up land in New Zealand as if they're going to be able to ride out <laughs> this in missile silos. I mean, the, the, you know, as I was saying earlier, we, we've, my generation has faced very little uh, hardship, but these guys have faced even less. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know how they, they expect to, to survive on a yeah. planet that's hostile, right? I mean, um, yeah. plus there's going to be a lot of angry people around. Um, right. But so let, let's get, get into your, uh, well, not your book, into uh, the, the book Food is Climate, uh, which mm-hmm. I, I would advise any, everyone to go and read. It's a very, very uh, easy, fairly short uh, read maybe 50 60 pages and then recipes so i think it's quite uh, uh open to to the majority um now for anyone who's not aware of this this is probably gonna uh blow their minds so i'll spend a bit of time on this but uh so your paper is um discussed uh, at length in this book and that's what mm-hmm. brought me to to the interview today and in this paper you're you're basically expanding on the work that Goodland and Anang did in 2009 for World Watch, and what you're saying is that their figure of 51%, which is already an incredible, uh, high, incredibly high number, what you're saying is that was actually the low threshold. That it's actually, mm. uh, am I right in saying it's the minimum 87%? Right, it's at least 87%. At least is what I'm saying. 87% of emissions. Now, of course, this is going to be. Uh, so if you, if you can try and explain to us, right. so, so idiots like me can understand uh, that, you, how did you come to this conclusion? So we formed an analogy to what's happening in the climate. Mm-hmm. And um, so this is what I call the bathtub problem. Imagine that a baby representing all life on earth is stuck in a climate bathtub. 
that's filling up with, with water at 50 liters per minute from two running faucets, okay? Now, the 50 liters per minute corresponds to the 50 gigatons of CO2 we are adding every year. Mm -hmm. So one minute is like one year, one liter is like one gigaton of CO2, okay? Or CO2 equivalent. Mm -hmm. So when you arrive, the bathtub has filled up with thousand liters of water. So there's thousand gigatons of CO2 extra in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. okay? So that's where that comes from. Now, there are the two machines, there are two faucets that are pouring water into the bathtub. One is the burning machine faucet that's pouring 35 liters per minute to the bathtub. And this is what everybody focuses on. That's the fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. okay. But this faucet is connected to the aerosol tank, an aerosol cistern, mm -hmm. which has 350 liters of water in it. So when you turn this off, this entire tank is going to empty into the bathtub. Okay, so these aerosols you're talking about, this is this is like aerosols from pollution, from like from a, burning, burning coal, coal and oil, right, right, burning okay. coal and oil. Yeah. So what what are they what are they doing at the moment in the atmosphere? They're cooling the earth. They're cooling the earth by like reflecting sunlight. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. About one third of the one third of the heat is not being seen uh -huh, because uh -huh. of the cooling we have put into the atmosphere. And if but as we turn this oh, off, hmm. this will come empty into the bathtub. Okay. Mm. So, so there, so these two faucets, this faucet is connected to this. So mm. you cannot turn one by itself. You have to turn both off, you know? Mm. So, so for every one liter per minute, you, you turn dial down the burning mm. machine faucet, you're going to get 10 liters one time into the bathtub. Oh, I see. Yeah, right, okay. Right, right. That's the first faucet. The mm. second faucet, this is the killing machine faucet. Mm. So as I said, totally between them, they're adding 50 liters per minute into the bathtub. But this is only adding 15 liters per minute. <laughs> okay. But it's connected to the drain, <laughs> which is clogged up. And the drain could take down 30 liters per minute. <laughs> okay. So for every one liter per minute that you reduce the killing machine faucet, <laughs> you open the drain by two liters per minute. Right. I'm with you. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> so which means if you turn this off, you're going to take out 15 liters per minute from, from going into the bathtub and you're going to drain the bathtub by 30 liters per minute. So mm. effectively, you're going to remove 45 liters per minute from the flow. Mm -hmm. So the flow will go from 50 liters per minute to five liters per minute. That's a 90% reduction. Right, right. Okay. So that is the uh, 87, that's where the 87% comes from. Okay. Because there is a bathtub drain that's going to open up. And this drain empties into the vegan reforestation tank. Mm. Okay, this tank can store two tons of CO2. Okay, mm. so we know that. And so I'm saying that every day, every year we eat animals, we are literally telling nature, don't heal. <laughs> mm. I don't want that 30, 30 gigatons being sequestered. You know, I don't want those forests to come back. So it's a choice we're making. So the choice between eating plant foods and eating animals is an extra 30 gigatons of CO2 being sequestered on the soil mm -hmm. versus 15 gigatons of CO2 being, being added to the atmosphere. So, so I guess what you're saying basically is that we, we're doing things the wrong way around at the moment, right? That we're, right. Ending, we're, we're moving towards the, what you call the burning machine, which is all the fossil fuels that we're burning. Right. And we're trying to focus on that first when really we should be focusing on animal agriculture, which you call the killing machine. And right. then, I mean, you, obviously, you, you you're not saying that we shouldn't stop burning the burning machine, right? But that no, we should I'm focus. Not you should, no, I'm saying, but you should be careful. Hmm. Meaning, when you, you should know that you're emptying this tank hmm. if you turn this off, which hmm. means when you start draining this, hmm. then you can lower this, hmm. and then what the bathtub level will come down. As the bathtub hmm. level comes down, then you can drain more and more. Right, right, right. The system, aerosol system. So. So there is a process. So it's actually an exponential process too, but it's it's not immediate. You cannot do it immediately. If you do it immediately, you're going to drown the baby. Mm. Okay. So basically, yeah, you, you're saying that we, that we need we need to focus on animal agriculture first, get that done, and then we can focus on the the burning machine because we we through freeing up all the, the land that we would have otherwise been using for pasture for grazing. 
that we'll be able to reforest that, suck in, sequester all this carbon and right. take all the pollutants out of the atmosphere and then we can turn off the burning machine. Is that about right? right? So, no, the, what I'm saying is if you shut off the killing machine right away, hmm. then you can turn off uh, the burning machine by at least five liters per minute right away. Mm-hmm. Because then it'll be 30 liters coming in, 30 liters going out, and the bathtub right. will not rise. Okay, mm-hmm. level will not rise. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. But if you if you then go from instead of 35, if you make it to 25, mm-hmm. okay, then you will be draining it by five liters per minute, mm-hmm. and then you can start emptying this tank slowly. I see. So yes, yes. so it becomes like a so. But the more you empty the bathtub, the more you can empty the tank. Right. It becomes a positive feedback loop. Okay. So you, you can shut off the burning machine faster and faster over time. But you need to begin knowing that that there is this cost mm. of shutting down mm. the burning machine. Okay. Can can I can I ask? I mean, I know in the past you you actually after watching Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, you actually went and worked for him, right? You were actually right. giving those mm-hmm. presentations around the world. Did did you have these conversations with him? Like yep. explaining what you've just explained to me? I had the conversation in my first meeting with him. You know, wow. meeting in, when he was training us, hmm. uh, I was thinking about, you know, because I'm a systems engineer, I look, I tend to look at things from a 10,000 foot perspective. And I asked the question, hey, if we just stop eating animals and return the forest that used to be there on the land that we're currently using for animal agriculture, can we not reverse climate change? Because I was doing numbers on the back of my envelope, you know, mm-hmm. saying that, you know, there is extra one trillion tons in the atmosphere, but there is nine trillion tons stored on land of CO2, three trillion tons in vegetation and six mm. trillion tons in the soil. Right, right. And even though we have cut half the trees on the planet. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I said, if we bring back the trees that we cut, can mm. we not? sequester an extra trillion tons. I mean, it seems tiny compared to nine trillion tons. Mm. <laughs> and he turned to Roy Neal, his chief of staff, and he said, how did this guy get in here? Wow. wow. He didn't want to talk about it. Really? So I, that's when I realized that they're, 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 they're trying to frame the story. Wow. So, I mean, it's, it, it is quite, I mean, the, the movie Cowspiracy was saying that it was a cow, uh, it was a conspiracy of the green group. So I had to ignore it, but what this sounds like is it's also a conspiracy to keep us in the keep us in the dark about what we should be doing right right uh-huh and that's, yeah and that's that's quite yeah it's quite alarming right? yeah it's it's um, about maintaining the colonial system mm-hmm. that's the uh, if you look at what is the primary motivation is mm-hmm. think of anyone who is running a ponzi scheme mm-hmm. okay who is the running a ponzi scheme let's say you know bernie madoff mm-hmm. right he was he was lying to his investors mm. in order to continue the Ponzi scheme. Mm-hmm. So that's what these people are stuck doing because they're playing a game. We are all playing mm. a game. So we uh, also yeah. bought into this because we, mm. we are playing the same growth game. We, want, mm. we are buying stocks and we are saying, let it grow, right? Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? So we are all participating in this game. And, sure. and so they are just, they have, they're playing their role in the game. Right. And their and role is not to tell us the truth, because if they tell the truth, the whole game collapses. Mm. And, I, and, I, and I guess the, the way they look at it is if they're not doing it, someone else is going to do it, right? The system right. is the system and someone's going to do it. So why, why, why not me kind of thing, I guess. So I, I, you, you briefly there, I think, talked about um, the, I think you said there's twice as much carbon in the soil as there are in the trees, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, right. Was that right? The figure is twice as much. Right. So right. I think that that's probably going to be interesting to a lot of people because most people think of carbon as being in the trees, right? They don't think of it as being in the soil. So I, I, I've heard you talk about in other interviews about um, you, you've been make, making this connection about the Saharan desert, the Libyan desert, the Arabian desert, the Syrian desert, the Tar desert, uh, and the Gobi desert. And you, you're making the point that all of these stretch around the same band of the planet and what they all have in common is that they were all the cradle of civilization. Right? <laughs> exactly. And, and they all used to be lush and green with trees right. and I guess carbon. So if there's twice as much below, then if there's all those trees, then you know that there's going to be a lot more underneath. 
and now when you look at all of these areas they're all deserts right mm -hmm. they used to be lush and green now they're all deserts and could, could you explain uh brief briefly like how do you go from that lush green to dry and brown we cut trees and we graze animals so what they do in uh, for pasture maintenance is that whatever the animals did not eat we cut that and burn it again every year we do that mm -hmm. so this is how you prevent the forest from coming back because otherwise the forest will come back the wild animals will come back and they'll start you know be, they'll be predators and they'll come after our animals right so we need to keep things safe for our animals mm -hmm. and so we need to make sure that wild animals cannot live there right yeah Yeah, that's yeah. what we do right that's how yeah. we do it and but the more you do it that forest then eventually dies out mm -hmm. and it becomes a desert so the desert is all man made you know it's the cradle of civilization meaning over thousands of years we have converted mm -hmm. forests into deserts mm -hmm. so um forests precede civilization deserts succeed them mm -hmm. but now we are facing this this ecological catastrophe where we have to start doing the opposite mm, mm, mm. Uh, we need to need routinely bring back forests that should mm. be part of the game that we play the new game that we play okay right right so uh, if you do that then we have a chance right if it if, but if we continue along the current path we don't have a chance <laughs> so i mean obviously I, th i think that's what's going on now with the uh, in in africa they have the the great green wall that the they're, they're growing on the sub-saharan uh and africa right just below the desert yeah. and they're also doing the same with the great green wall in china with perhaps less right success at the moment so is it true am I, am, is it true to say that the gobi desert is the fastest growing on earth i don't know that i have i don't have the statistics on that but okay the, the uncd report probably does do that tell okay you that. so I, th i think I'm, i'm not sure if it maybe was in the, that the food is climate book but Mm -hmm. it would would it, would that also be being driven in part i mean obviously part of it is, is climate but it, right. a part of it is also from uh grazing animals right right absolutely so it's the number one cause of desertification is right. grazing animals yeah and if you think about it even when we, if we if we are uh, building a great green wall in the sahara mm -hmm. and then uh, we are displacing animals that that used to graze there you know i mean and we are probably Uh, then to raise the same animals we are burning down the amazon <laughs> that is not a good trade off no 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 it's not okay so this is why animal agriculture and uh, avoiding animal foods and and avoiding animal products of any kind mm. for any purpose whatsoever is central mm. to any solution to climate change yeah and i'm i'm i i mentioned about the the gobi desert in particular because in japan every few years those sandstorms actually reach japan and people mm. all, always complain about uh about this about how the, you know all this right. this uh sand coming over from china but i mean it's if it's due in part to to animal agriculture and you know obviously japan is is taking it is uh playing its part in this right right that, absolutely uh, they for the most part japan is exporting uh this to other countries right it's not um cutting down its own trees um mm -hmm. they just buy it bringing everything in um so get, getting back to your paper i think you you state in there that 37% of ice free land is used for animal agriculture is that the correct figure mm -hmm. for grazing uh huh for grazing, for grazing so, alone well, well, why is there less carbon under under the ground where it's i guess with grass than there are right. when it's got uh trees well see think of a tree right so the trees behind you they store a lot of carbon mm. because the half the weight of a tree is carbon mm. okay that used to be in the atmosphere now the below ground weight of a tree is equal to the above ground weight of a tree right so all the roots mm. of the tree mm. would be another so you have to double the carbon from just counting the below ground weight of the tree then you add the soil which is another uh, one more component so that becomes 3x So this is why this is how you take the the above ground weight of a tree and you triple it. Mm. That will be the total carbon sequestration oh. on that land. Right. Right. Okay. Now in a grazing land, you hardly have any trees. Mm -hmm. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, 
uh, even the soil carbon goes away you know mm. okay so i think uh, james hansen the the grandfather of climate science is saying that we need to i think remove about 12 and a half percent of the co2 that's in the atmosphere if we're mm -hmm. to get back to uh 350 parts per million right um at the moment we seem to be focusing all of our attention and also the investment on things like carbon capture and storage ccs right. Right. at the moment these are you know they, they emit more emissions than they actually capture right. and, and obviously they're going to be it's going to be hugely expensive and uh it's going to take a long time to be able to get this up right. to to uh to size for the planet is there a more effective way that we can obviously reduce <laughs> this atmosphere so uh so we have a tendency in the civilization never to address the root cause mm -hmm. to just find a way to um, paper over the symptoms right that's what we are doing to the planet mm -hmm. and at this point we have to put our foot down and say enough mm -hmm. you know enough with this colonization um, mm -hmm. mantra you know mm -hmm. no more colonialism colonialism is dead sure okay. yes, yes we are going to have to figure out a way mm. to to decolonize the planet and that's the only way you're going to solve climate change fundamentally okay mm. otherwise we're going to be looking for bypass surgeries on the planet mm. yeah it's like bypass surgery a chemotherapy and this mm. sort of nonsense that we do to our bodies mm. now we're doing to the whole planet yeah i mean and, yeah some of some of yeah. the the solutions that they're bandying about are absolutely crazy right i mean they're it's ridiculous. We need. Blood. We should. Yeah, we should not tolerate it at all. You know, we no, should say no, no. enough. Enough I mean, already. The, the climate scientists are saying they're openly yeah. saying that if we do one thing here, it's going to have an impact here, and millions of people right. are going to die. And and right. we're like, oh well, that seems okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Um, I mean, it's similar to the to the COVID pandemic, right? I mean, right. we can all see that you know the the solution to this would be to stop breeding animals and it's, it's, especially to stop factory farming, right? But that's not being mentioned as a solution at all. It's uh, it's just you know take take this these vaccines and then we'll be okay. But of course, it's going to keep coming back with seventy five percent of you know infectious diseases, new and emerging infectious diseases coming from animals, right? Right. Yeah. So they're not they're not. It's going to keep coming back, and so it's but it's up to us, especially those who have felt the brunt of colonization. Mm to stand up and say we are done with this mm. you know you guys figure it out i mean you we are going to be decolonizing mm. uh, the system if you want to join us join us if you don't want to join us we are going to run over you <laughs> we are going to create this okay we are going to create this new system i don't give a damn who's opposing me mm. you know whether it's boris johnson or joe mm. biden or whoever the hell it is mm. it doesn't matter we are going to create a system of normal non violence and we are going to have a decolonized world because the the time for colonialism is over mm. it's over do, okay. do you do you see this change actually occurring now yep. in, in in india yeah well india you know it's it, it's india is getting more and more colonized because <laughs> the, if the mcdonalds is in there mm. you know coca cola is in there you know mm. i mean these corporations are like like the english east india company uh, yes. this is the new version of the english east india company mm. you know and they are colonizing the whole world right mm. through um these these corporations mm. but uh, uh i mean again people are playing games they are just stuck in the ro in their role in the game right so we need to figure out a different game if unless yes. we figure out a different game and create a new system we have right. no business telling people to change yet. right i mean yeah it's it's buckminster fuller time right with you know with, right. there's no point you know you have to build the system first and right. make the old one obsolete um and i think i mean it looks like uh, with, with with things like extinction rebellion now in in the uk mm -hmm. and the movement with fridays for future there's definitely a groundswell of people that I would agree with you uh, for sure mm -hmm. that uh, they want to see an end to this right they realize that it's destructive and uh, and no one really is benefiting even the people who are you know with billion dollar yachts they're not really benefiting they're still suffering the same as everyone else right oh yeah and even um, worse from, yeah, yeah from the the stress and the yeah, you know everything that goes with that yeah you think about it you know i mean uh, i go to the villages of india you know and uh, and most people are fundamentally happy so long as they have enough to eat mm. 
they're fundamentally happy people right yes right and then i come to the to america where everyone has as much food as they want you know yes, they yes, can yes, yes. and yes. half the people are on antidepressants yes yeah. and anti anxiety medications yeah i mean there's there's so much data out there to prove this right to say that right. the, those the, the richer nations are more unhappy than the poorer nations i mean <laughs> Bhutan is constantly coming out on top, right? I mean, right. I lived in the Philippines and the Philippines is a, a point in case it's, the people are just really, really happy. They've got nothing. They're like, come <laughs> into your house, they give you food, they'll give you beer. And it's, you know, they're, they're just a really, really happy people with nothing. I think what we all crave essentially is connections, right? Mm -hmm. That's what right. we're all, we're all desperate for these connections and the current system we've got is just atomizing us all into these little, um bubbles of our own where we we go home from work work all day go home from work and then we log into facebook and see everyone else is happy from all the posts they're putting on facebook and it's another social media it's just leading to this uh huge rise in depression right right yeah um so yeah i mean I, I'm, I'm glad that uh yeah that that's happening and uh hopefully we, we can get to this new world in time uh because yeah. we are against the clock right I'm not sure sure if you saw, uh, I think it was in the news yesterday, that the EU and the USA have just pledged to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Did you <laughs> see that? Well, uh, yeah, it's it's too little. Well, of course, I mean, it's, yeah, they're, they're, it's carbon is 45% cuts, they're supposed, right? So right. Why, why methane 30%? But Right, yeah. But the, the, it's too little. And methane is, methane, uh, I mean, as I point out in the paper, uh, mm. the incremental warming mm. from methane from animal agriculture alone is greater than the incremental warming from the CO2 from all fossil fuel sources combined mm -hmm -hmm. on an annual basis. Okay. Yeah. So, can, you, can you explain that a, a little bit? So 37% of the methane, mm. methane comes from animal agriculture. Mm. On an annual basis, the methane that we're adding to the atmosphere is causing an extra... 0.096 watts per square meter of heating. Mm -hmm. So you just calculate you know, from the IPCC's formulas mm -hmm. and you will see that it's adding 0.096 watts per square meter of heating. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas the CO2 from all sources combined is adding 0.031 watts per square meter of heating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's about one third the methane. And that's just, yeah. where is all the other methane coming from? Oh, the methane comes from uh, from animal agriculture, mm. from uh, natural gas sources, mm. leakage from natural gas sources, from uh, rice paddies, mm -hmm. and you know anywhere where there is stagnant water, right, can, right. Yeah, and landfills. But like the that. largest the largest cause of methane is is animal agriculture, right? Right. Okay. Every cow emits something like two hundred and fifty to five hundred liters of methane every day. Mm. Mm -hmm. In terms of the volume of gas, yeah. Well, I mean, this is—it was interesting. I was reading this article that I just mentioned, uh, and the the president for the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, I think, Derwood Zoic. Mm -hmm. This is what he said, uh, and I'll quote: "Cutting methane is the single biggest and fastest way to slow warming in the next two decades, and it gives us the best chance for keeping the 1.5 degree goal in sight." Cutting methane is our best and probably last hope to keep the planet, planet safe. safe. The key is to use the global methane pledge as a beachhead for an all-out assault to cut this super climate pollutant as fast as possible. I mean, that's pretty clear there, right? But the same article, I think, when it listed the causes of methane, it listed animal agriculture last. Right. <laughs> you know, it was, and you're reading it and you're like, why? And this was the environment correspondent for The Guardian, which is probably the best newspaper about dealing, well, the mainstream uh, newspaper about dealing with the climate right. and biodiversity crisis. And they list it as, you know, the, as the bottom of the, the causes. And it's um, <laughs> mind blowing because, right. you know, it, it, people could be empowered to to make those changes if you just tell them the truth. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so that's what the yeah, the methane. I mean, deforestation is something uh, we we talked about briefly. But um, in Japan, uh, basically, Japan uh, hundreds of years ago basically cut down all of their trees, and then right at the last minute realized that they'd made a massive mistake, 
reforested all their mountains in Japanese cedar. And now I think like 90% of the country or something is covered in trees. So most people don't think about deforestation here, but mm -hmm. the, what, what Japan has done essentially is just outsourced, outsourced. <laughs> deforestation to other poorer countries, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia, right? And uh, I think interestingly is the, the Japanese are the second biggest importer of Aussie beef, Australian beef, uh, after the United States. And of course, the entire East Coast rainforest of Australia is being decimated to graze cows, right? And right. the Japanese love koalas. It's all like kawaii, kawaii, koalas. But by buying this Aussie beef, they are basically leading to the uh, extinction of these koalas, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously with the, with the burning uh, as well that's going on there now with most of the other, other animals as well. So what you talked about earlier with the killing machine and the burning machine, would it be true to say that if we, if we address, oh, sorry, if, if we address the um, killing machine first, we would be addressing both the climate and biodiversity crisis. Whereas if we only focus on the burning machine, the fossil fuels, basically we're only gonna be addressing CO2, right? Right, right, absolutely. So if you only address the burning machine, first of all, you're going to get the aerosols on your head. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, and that's going to cause heating, mm. which is going to accelerate the killing mm. of, the, of the wildlife, the mm. biodiversity because the last thing you need to be doing is to heat up the planet mm. faster than it's already heating up. Uh, Jim Hansen actually said, the rate at which we are um, going, we are actually going to increase the heating by a factor of two in the next few decades, mm. next couple of decades. The models are showing that we're gonna double the heating compared to what happened in the first two decades. Mm -hmm. Why? Because aerosols are disappearing. Mm. Right. See, what's happening is, if you, if you look at the past, right? If you look at the temperature increase in the past, you will notice that, that between 1940 and 1970, mm. the temperature remained quite flat. Mm. It didn't go up, okay? And the reason is that mm. that's the time when we, Moved to gas. we were increasing aerosols and CO2 simultaneously. Mm -hmm. We were burning coal, oil, we were polluting everything, you know? <laughs> so we see it's canceling it out and canceling it out yeah it was canceling mm. it out and then in the 1970s we discovered acid rain mm. we discovered that we were killing the, our trees and our forests right, so then right. we started putting scrubbers on our coal-fired power plants so we started you know just cleaning up the sulfur from going up into the atmosphere only in 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 the west we did that and then the temperature went up because we cleaned out the aerosols Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then in the in the two thousands, China and India started building a lot of coal fired power plants, mm -hmm. and uh, and so they didn't put scrubbers in the beginning mm -hmm. because it's cheaper to just burn right. it, right? Yes, yes, yes. So they put a bunch of aerosols, and now they're cleaning up their act because they're also <laughs> discovering acid rain. Right, 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 right. Right. So mm -hmm. so now the aerosols are coming down, and therefore the heating is going up. And mm -hmm. I'm saying, yeah, it's okay. The heating, you know, the aerosols have to come down, but let's shut down the killing machine first. So mm -hmm. that it gives room for us to clean up the atmosphere. I, I suppose one of, one of those uh, ways that we're gonna clean up is through the oceans, right? I mean, as we mentioned earlier, the oceans have been sucking in a lot of that carbon, which has been leading obviously to the, uh, the coral reefs uh, dying off and bleaching and uh, the rest of it. So, a Japanese audience will probably find this quite interesting because they historically they've relied on the oceans for a lot of their calories, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously there are ethical reasons to avoid uh, killing life in the oceans as well. But from mm -hmm. a pragmatic view for the Japanese, why do you think it's important that we also avoid eating seafood? Yeah, well, if you don't avoid eating seafood, you're going to poison yourself to death. So that's it's as simple as that. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> there is everything we pour into the atmosphere gets into the ocean, mm. everything. Mm -hmm. So every year we are pouring more and more into the atmosphere, more and more toxins into the atmosphere. We pour about 250 billion tons mm -hmm. of toxins into the atmosphere, into the environment every year. Mm -hmm. That is 250 billion elephants. Mm -hmm. It's about 30 elephants per person. Wow. Okay? That's how much we are pouring. This is total weight mm -hmm. okay, pouring into the atmosphere. 
and it works its way up the food chain mm. it gets more and more concentrated okay? now it is bad for the fish because they are eating all these toxins and they are eating all this plastic and they are storing it in their bodies and they are getting poisoned mm. Mm. but it is worst for the humans who eat the fish bioaccumulation right i mean it's yeah, bioaccumulation so, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so Japanese are going to be forced to eat plant foods because otherwise they're going to die. It's as simple as that. Well, I think also, I mean, there's just not going to be any fish left, right? <laughs> at, right. at current levels, there's, there's already they're uh, you know they're basically you know we've, we've tipped the oceans into complete collapse, right? Right. Not mm -hmm. they're not not the collapse isn't uh, complete yet, but it's on the way there. The the, the industry is decimating. Uh, all you know, uh, whales, dolphins, uh, right. penguins are going extinct. You know, in in Africa, in the the South African penguins are going extinct because we're taking away all their all their food sources, right? And uh, right. they're being you know they're washing up on beaches, and so I think yeah, obviously, at some point, I guess the point is we are going to have to move to plant boost based right. diets, right? We can either right. choose to do it and save some of wildlife, the wildlife and the planet. And, a, and a, a living functioning ecosystem or the ecosystem will force us to do it right right yeah ultimately so, nature is the boss you know she will do it she will force us to do it the question is do you want to suffer and then be forced <laughs> to do it or do you want to do it now so it's you know to me covid19 was mother nature sending us to our, our rooms to think about what we have done yes, yes and yes. to and to think about whether we're going to come out as better species Mm. Or are we going to continue the same behavior? Mm. If we continue the same behavior, she's going to send us to our rooms again. Mm. So, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, yeah. When you when you make that analogy, it's interesting because the the last big pandemic was in what 1918, and that was straight mm. after World War One. So it's like, okay, I'm going to give you a lesson, right. and <laughs> you know, and we didn't we didn't heed heed that lesson, and now we get another one 100 years later. Um, so yeah, no, that's an interesting analogy there i think um so i carried out i mean we i think we briefly got to this but i i carried out a google news search for your report and i found that the only mainstream news outlet to talk about it was forbes magazine which was an interesting right. one mm -hmm. so i mean obviously the overriding question i have here is why do you think that the mainstream media <laughs> and governments as well largely focus on industry and transport right which are a tiny minuscule amount well not, obviously industry is not a minuscule amount but um rather than animal agriculture right. yeah the same reason why they so don't talk about animal agriculture when they talk about pandemics mm. you know, even though it's obvious it's self-evident right. for anybody and it's you know anybody who has half a brain yeah mm. right so the same reason it's the same reason why they don't talk about my report because my report is candid it's a little bit like you know it's an engineering report what it is, is what a good engineer would do mm. because engineering is about sifting through science and and figuring out how do you solve the problem mm. okay mm -hmm. that's what i did and what i showed in that climate bath analogy is that the number one thing you should be doing is shutting down the killing machine so I'm saying 87% of our attention should be on the killing machine, hmm. and on the burning. Then you'll be doing the right solutions. So, I mean, if you, if your figures are correct here, Silas, and, I, and I'm I'm obviously I'm not a scientist, so uh, I can I can see my 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 the lo <laughs> logic dictates to me that you are correct, but uh, you're going to need to get the other climate scientists on board, right? Because this is uh, their this is their. Um, subjects here and if you're correct it means that they're kind of in the dark about what they're doing so how, how would you convince them do you think people who are stuck in the old system are not going to see it so mm -hmm. i say that this is like the 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 sun going around the earth uh, overturning that axiom mm -hmm. required some effort but ultimately people are everyone said galileo was right and only then could newton make progress right yes 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 because without that, you couldn't make any progress. Mm -hmm. In the same way, there are two axioms that we now have to overturn. So it's actually a double Galileo moment. Okay? It's, there are two axioms that have to be overturned. First is the false axiom of consumerism, which is that happiness comes from stoking and satisfying a never-ending series of desires, which is what our system is based on. Sure. Right? Sure. And this is why all these ads are there. This is why how money is distributed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is what scientists are all 
kowtowing to the false axiom of consumerism mm. okay and that is absolutely false mm. Mm. how do i know that well we have known it for 10000 years that is false <laughs> mm. yes yes i mean yes. at least 10000 years mm. we have we got epics about it you know we have epics about it that we have a we have one epic in in, in india that has a 10 headed villain who every time he cut off a head a new head is born and he represents desires in human mm. beings right and and so the whole story the moral of the story is don't fall for it yes and yeah. we we actually celebrate this epic every year so we know this already okay mm-hmm. that's that's the first axiom that's false the second axiom that's false is the false axiom of supremacism mm-hmm. which is that life is a competitive game in which those who have gained an advantage may possess enslave and exploit animals nature and the disadvantaged mm. for their false pursuit of happiness mm. yeah that's yeah. the false axiom of supremacism and both those axioms have to be overturned mm-hmm. because our entire system is based on these two false axioms okay so we wrote a whole paper on it it's called the engineer solutions to scientist warnings and we point out that you know as long as your foundational axioms are false all your solutions are going to be incorrect <laughs> okay yes, so every yes. solution they come up with every you know like i tell even the students who go through a sustainability course at asu or arizona state university and they get a degree in sustainability <laughs> and i tell them you have been lied to because as long as these two axioms of these false axioms are there in the system you will never be sustainable <laughs> mm. how, how do like they trying to that? build huh Oh, sorry I, i was going to how do they respond to that <laughs> they feel like they have been ripped off i tell them mm. you have been ripped off okay you've been lied to you've been made to pay like you know 200000 dollars for your education and you've been <laughs> lied to we are telling these kids you know here is sustainability here is how you get to a sustainable world by solving all these problems and it's absolutely false it's wrong mm. why because we are still basing it on the old false axioms Right. I guess uh, I mean that will lead me to nicely into I guess the next question because you you were talking earlier about uh, our current system just constantly um focuses on the um symptoms rather than the cause, right? Mm-hmm. So around the world at the moment in America and uh, in Syria, Iraq, uh, Australia, basically everywhere we're running out of water, right? Uh mm-hmm. aquifers are being drained uh the rivers are not reaching the the sea anymore and uh you know I, i was listening to bill mayer uh real time with bill mayer uh, last week and he he was and this week again he mentioned it about building a pipeline from the east where they've got too much water to the west where they don't have any water right and that's again it's kind of just focusing on a symptom what do you do, do you think there's a, a better way that we can uh, respond to the water crisis that we're about to face so to address the root cause of the water crisis you really have to return land back to nature mm. and you have to bring back the forests because the forests are the ones that clean the water yes yes you think about what a tree does tree takes water from the ground and it filters it mm. through the root system it filters it so it's like because everything in the tree is made of carbon it's like a carbon filter so by the time it transpires through the leaves it is pure water mm is trying to purify the water before it transpires to the leaves right. and then it stores all the toxins in its trunk mm-hmm. okay so the tree trunks are full of toxins now okay because of all the toxins we have poured into the atmosphere this is nature's way of cleaning up mm-hmm. our mess trying its best huh? <laughs> trying its best trying its best and and so far we have been taking credit for all the all of nature's trying its best and as and pretending we did it <laughs> <laughs> hmm. and it, is, i mean it would it would also be true to say i mean especially in in america but i, I am guessing elsewhere as well that meat based diets just they use so you know an extortionate amount of water compared to plant based mm-hmm. diets right right so it's actually the other way around it's actually even more than that in even worse than that so i said think about uh, an almond tree Okay mm-hmm. people will say almonds take a lot of water right yeah. i say actually you should thank the almond tree for taking so much water because what is the almond tree doing is taking water it's filtering it and sending it up through its leaves 
right? So it's actually responsible for more water circulation in the purification of the water than, than any other tree. Mm. So you need bending down on your knees and you know, kissing the ground in front of an almond tree, thanking the almond tree for doing all that work. Mm -hmm. So think of the water, cycle, the water footprint of a plant-based food as, as something positive. Mm. Whereas, whereas the water footprint of an animal-based food is something negative. So right. it means yeah. more it is, the worse it is for us. Mm -hmm. But a plant-based food, the more it is, the better it is for us. Right, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. So think about it this way. So mm. we need to flip our mindset when you think about these things. Because mm. um, trees are part of a, a virtuous cycle of water. Mm. So the more water they use, the better off we are because it's part no. of the cleaning up of the process. Okay. Whereas no. it's a part of the negative cycle, which is it turning the water in more and more <laughs> pollutant, mm. right? polluting the water more and more. So if you use more of the animal, uh, more water in the animal foods, you're actually polluting more water. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd never, yeah, I'd never hear that. Uh, yeah. So, so I say, you know, I mean, this is why when I, when scientists, these are scientists, by the way, who are comparing almonds to, <laughs> to, to, to dairy milk and saying, oh, almonds are just as bad as dairy milk. I say, I, you, you haven't even thought through this. Right. I mean, they're literally just looking at uh, water use, right? Yeah. And I think even, even almond milk is even way less, it's using way less water than, than uh, milk anyway, right? I think it's like half yeah, or yeah. something, you know? Um, in fact, most almond milk is not even using almonds, you know? It's just, it's got two almonds in it. It's water. <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly thickeners. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So, okay. Would you, would you say, would you be saying that's not so he healthy then? No, it's not. It's, it's fine. not healthy. Just, just taking it. Oh, it's not healthy, right? Yeah, I just take. I mean, if you can make almonds at home, I mean, almond milk at home, it's healthy, right? So you can basically grind up almonds, soak them, grind them up, and filter it. You get almond milk. Mm. Okay. Oh, yeah. I just want to move into like a few uh, devil's advocate questions with you. Um, so, a buzzword at the moment is regenerative agriculture, right? It's uh, right. I think. The book Drawdown, uh, Paul Hawkins' book uh, Drawdown, I think they listed as the 11th biggest solution, Silesh. Do you, what, what do you think of its potential? Well, regenerative agriculture is good, provided it's plant-based regenerative agriculture. Mm. Okay. So it's always good not to pour chemicals into it, into the system and so on, and letting nature regenerate mm. and bring back the forest that we cut. But what the animal agriculture industry is trying to promote is, you know, it's like saying, okay, I'm going to chop down the forest and uh, graze the animals. And then when the forest tries to come back, I usually go and chop it again every year and burn it. Okay, mm -hmm. That's what we do now. It's called the pasture maintenance fires. Mm -hmm. So in order to pretend like they're actually sequestering carbon, they're telling us, no, 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 we won't chop it anymore. <laughs> we let the forest come back. Until, of course, we chop it again, right? So mm. <laughs> they're playing games. They're playing shell games. Because if we don't chop the forest down, why are they chopping the forest down now? Because the animals don't eat that vegetation that was growing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, farmed animals, right? The farmed animals yeah. don't eat that vegetation that's growing. And they don't want the wild animals to come back mm. okay, to compete for that food, right? So because when the wild animals come back, then the predators will come back. The predators mm -hmm. will then start eating the livestock, the, the farmed animals, because they're easy to catch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me like a lot of people to me mention about regenerative farming and they, they mean using animals. And it just, I don't know, it just seems, again, it's kind of a perverse thing that we do, <laughs> right? That we, we go, oh, come here and help us, help us regenerate the land so that we can live. And in return, we're going to kill you. We're going <laughs> to chop you up into bits and kill you. It just seems like a... People don't think about it, right? But it's it's like that's just a continuation of the same mindset that's got us into these problems. It's just like, oh, we'll use them in a different way this time. <laughs> you right. know, instead of putting them inside little barns and you know in cages, we'll put them outside and then we'll kill them. Right. But it's yeah, I mean it's, it's just it's less efficient too. So it's right. less efficient than putting yeah. them in barns and, and cages. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna use more land. Where did that land come from? Well, it right. came from forests. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is that the right trade-off? Chop mm -hmm. down the Amazon to grow more, you know, these regenerative farms? No, mm -hmm. it's not the right trade-off. 
Right. So okay. anyway, it's a uh, it is a it's a joke, and we need to see through it. And you know, and that that they're it's another shell game they're playing mm-hmm. to continue the system, but it's getting harder and harder. You know, mm-hmm. to, to fool people. Yeah, definitely. I think so. I think so. Um, so I think at the moment you're working on a a project that is the Vegan World 2026 project, right? Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, the Vegan World 2026 project is based on the observation that mm. if we continue the current system until 2026, we are on track to wipe out almost 100% of all wild animals. Mm. Okay, so we need to create now a pull in the opposite direction. Mm. And the opposite direction is to have a completely vegan world by 2026. Right. Can, can right. I ask you a question about that? Where, where does that data come from, the 2026 uh, oh, it, extinction? Okay, so you look at the World Wildlife Fund Living Planet Report, mm. which uh, does a statistical survey of over 3,500 species. Mm. And it has been count. It's been accumulating the total biomass of those species. So it's not a, it's not a true extinction. It's like a functional extinction. Okay. Right. 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 We're looking at the total biomass. Hmm. The total biomass declined between 1970 and 2010 by 52 percent. Hmm. Hmm. By 2012, it became 58 hmm. percent. By 2016, it became 68 percent. Wow. <laughs> so it's going down. Hmm. You know, so it's going to hit 100 percent by 2026. Mm-hmm. And you could say, hey, there is still one tiger left, you know, right. so it's not extinct yet. And we can keep mm-hmm. the tiger alive for 70 years, right? Mm-hmm. Pretend mm-hmm. that the tiger is still not extinct. But that's just you and I, you know, playing statistical games. It's got right. nothing to do with life. Yeah. Right. So, so I say that fu- functional extinction is going to happen by 2026. Okay. And what, what, are you, what, what are you doing with this project to reach that goal? Oh, so uh, we are saying, okay, to get to a plant-based system, plant-based world, you really have to overturn colonialism and you have to overturn carnism. Mm. So carnism is the foundation on which colonialism is built. And sexism, racism, all the isms are built on top of that carnism. Mm. Because if you cannot exploit animals, you cannot exploit other people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you can't say I will treat animals nicely and then exploit people. And excuse me. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, some people tend to, there are some people that do that, but of course, yeah, it's a ridiculous position to hold, right? But <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So, which means you need a system in which everyone feels like they belong. Hmm. And everyone hmm. feels like they're not exploited. Hmm. Okay? Hmm. Everyone should routinely feel like they're not being exploited. Mm-hmm. So it's a different system altogether. So I say mm-hmm. it has to be based on the correct axioms. Mm-hmm. It has to be based on the true axiom of inner peace mm-hmm. as opposed to the false axiom of consumerism. Mm-hmm. True axiom of inner peace says that the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by looking for it within ourselves mm-hmm. as opposed to these objects outside, right? Mm-hmm. And it has to be based on the true axiom of unity mm-hmm. of life as opposed to the false axiom of supremacism. The true axiom of unity of life says that all life is one family in which we each bring our unique skills, Mm. give all we can, receive all we need, and become all we are. Mm -hmm. So now, based on these two axioms, can you create a game? Mm. Can you create a system? And that's what we are working on. You know, we Mm -hmm. create a system in which people feel like, people have to feel like they are free to do what they want and they feel like they automatically belong in society. Mm, mm, mm. They automatically belong. You don't have to do anything to a colonial master in order to belong. Because right. think of what we are doing today. So we tell people, you know, um, everyone has a right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. You know, this is what the Declaration of American Declaration of Independence said. Mm. Right? <laughs> the God-given right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And then we teach children, you have to earn a living. Mm. Wait a minute. What happened to the right to life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? so we say one thing and do the exact opposite. Yes. And so. that's a sign that our axioms are false. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's a sign that in, in engineering, it's known as your specs and your implementation are wrong. Mm-hmm. Say so why? Because you're, you're 
math is incorrect or your science is incorrect. Mm. <laughs> I mean, do, do you think it's, I mean, I, uh, do, do you think that it is possible to do by 2026? I mean, we're five years away or four, four years away almost. So mm -hmm. if the take a foot off it, this old growth model has to go, right? Mm -hmm. But we need to build the, the brakes, meaning to build a system that um, allows us to slow down and then eventually reverse and go back, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think the, uh, we have everything we need to build the brakes. Mm -hmm. We have everything we need. We know what to do. Mm -hmm. We need to build it on the right axioms. It's mm -hmm. a simple engineering you know, it's not even as complicated as the internet that I was building. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. yeah. The technical standpoint is not that complicated. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you create a system where people automatically come and contribute as opposed to who have to go earn a living? Yeah. And so it's a different currency mechanism. So it's a bottom up currency mechanism as opposed to a top down currency mechanism. And it requires actually, then you also have to measure, you know, uh, accurately measure our ecological footprint. Mm -hmm. and make sure that we stay within the bounds so now, i mean like a i mean a, a key something key is probably something like a price on a very very effective rising price on carbon as our carbon budget goes down right well it's uh, accurately measure your carbon mm. and make sure that you stay within bounds right yes yes okay so it doesn't have to be a price on see if you and once you talk about a price on carbon you're bringing you're bringing it into the old model Mm. where it's a, there is a top down currency mechanism mm. right and you're saying let's make the top down currency mechanism more honest than it is but you still have a few colonial masters who are running the whole thing mm. <laughs> yeah and, i mean it's, mm. and i'm saying hey excuse me <laughs> who died and made you the boss of the planet right mm. <laughs> you may be pimp charles or you may be the rothschilds <laughs> i don't care you just you're born into this game so let's create another game, right? Which, like Buckminster Fuller said, start hmm. another one. Would, Don't would, try to fight the old one, build a new would, one. Would, would um, I'm trying to think of, I mean, Gandhi was working before he was assassinated. Gandhi wanted to have like every village was uh, self-sufficient, autonomous right. villages, right? Is that something that you'd be? You, yeah. It's, yeah? It's, see, but Gandhi, Gandhi did not have the technologies that we have today. Right. Yeah. The yeah. cryptocurrency systems, you know, the the uh, systems for trading without needing a central authority in between. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Gandhi was trying to base his his new model on old principles like right. caste system, mm -hmm. and you know, so so this is why I think it was not the right time. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. is the right time to do this. Mm -hmm. We can actually create systems that. Uh, connect us across the globe mm. as one single human family. Mm. That is, so because I say that as soon as we re recognized, as soon as we realized as a species that we were causing the climate to change on the planet, we automatically assumed responsibility for maintaining it. Mm. Okay, It's our mm. job. It's We own the climate, whether we like it or not. We own the climate mm. okay, of the planet. So, which means that all the other animals are saying to us, do your job. Mm. Right, because I mean, every, all the other animals, all the other species, they have their functioning part in the ecosystem. Exactly. We're basically the only one that doesn't have that anymore, right? Well, we do. Well, we we do, do, yeah. yeah, so the point you're making is, we, what, what, what would you say is the role that we have? I say that we always had a role mm. of being the climate regulator species. We always mm. did. Mm. We mm. maintained that climate for 10,000 years. Without even knowing it, okay, during the current interglacial period, without even knowing it, we maintain the climate for ten thousand years by just chopping down trees. <laughs> <laughs> so we prevented the ice age from ever happening. And then over the last two hundred years, we actually figured out science. We figured out technology that we can now use to measure what we are doing, mm -hmm. and then understand that we have a role in the ecosystem, a conscious role to be a climate regulator species. Previously, we were unconscious climate regulator species. Now we have become conscious of the climate regulator species mm. of the planet, right? So it's, it's, it's about yeah. take, taking up that role and saying, yeah, we have a job to do. So the other animals are really our bosses. Mm. We're not mm. here to dominate them. Mm. They're here to tell us, hey, dude, you're not doing yeah. your job. 
Well, we can I learn mean, from them, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so I guess you it's a, kind of like what Russell Brand likens to the uh, a revolution of consciousness, right? Is what we need. You look at what is happening, you look at the science, and look at uh, how reality is unfolding, and you tell stories about it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And based on the stories, we act, right? If the story we tell is that nature is in uh, fighting us and we are fighting nature and we are going to see who's the boss and who's who's dominant and who can control nature and so on and so forth, we are swirling down the toilet bowl and we are going to go away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Science is telling us that now, right? Science mm-hmm. is telling us that. The other story we can tell is that nature has always been the boss. Mm. No species, every species has no choice but to be in alignment with nature. Mm -hmm. No choice. The elephant has no choice but to be in alignment with nature. The elephant does not even know that it's in in alignment with nature, Mm. but she is. Everything she does is already in alignment with nature. Mm. In the same way, we have no choice but to be in alignment with nature. Mm -hmm. And so we always were part of nature. Always were. And we were the climate regulator species all along. We just didn't know it. Right. And now we're, now we're, we we're becoming know. aware of it, right? And uh, now we're becoming aware of it. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a race against time, this, a game, a race against uh, time. And if we don't win it, it's basically game over for our species in a very slow and painful <laughs> manner, right? Well, it may not even be slow and painful. I mean, I'm saying that. So assume. Well, okay, well yeah. I mean, any- any engineering project, I always do that. I assume the worst case. And I say, can I live with that? And can I make sure that I can uh, over that? You know? mm-hmm. So we always like, when, I, when you do a design of this, when, uh, all over this, I have to assume the worst case FM radio interference or AM radio interference. Uh, I have to assume the worst case interference among pairs and make sure that it works in spite of that. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so when we do that kind of analysis on climate change, we have to assume the worst. Mm-hmm. And the worst is that it could be that we are done in the mm-hmm. next 10 years. We are done. <laughs> yeah. That, that, I mean, that's, there, 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 are, there, there, are, there are scientists. That who, puts I mean, a sense of urgency in you, right? Mm-hmm. Even though the probability is low, probability mm-hmm. maybe, you know, right now the estimate is maybe 5% you know, mm-hmm. that it's mm-hmm. going to get there. But 5% probability that you're going to be extinct, is that, is that not something worrying to you? Excuse me. 10 years, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Mm. Right. And, and our leaders are focused on this 2050 thing and, and it just gets everybody to, ah, okay, we've got time. We've got 30 years to solve this, right? But uh, obviously, as exactly. we've been talking about, they're, they're misleading us in a giant uh, way, right? So you, your website, climatehealers.org, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, I've been looking through it. You've got some really, really good resources, lots of PowerPoints and uh, PDFs. Um, what, what is your um, message to people that that watch this video and are worried as we are about our future? No, I, I say find your niche, find your role. Everyone has a gift to give mm-hmm. in this transformation. And I say that, you know, in my in my opinion, Nature is the most amazing system design ever. Okay. <laughs> it's probably the most, the perfect system design ever. Mm-hmm. So trust that you belong, mm-hmm. that we all belong, and that this is going to sort itself out. And we are going to be part of the process of sorting itself out. And the best way to do that is to bring your gifts mm. to make this new transformation happen. We know what to do. Mm. We have to create a system in which everyone belongs. Mm. So I have the whole list of things that need to transform, right? The seven core shifts Mm. and creating a new game. So I say that whatever is on the left-hand side of the seven core shifts, right now we have created a game that automatically makes us do that. So we need to create a game in which we automatically do everything on the right-hand side of that. Mm. 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 And it's not that hard to figure out a game like that. Okay, so we are working on it. And so we need help though. We need Mm. everyone's, this is no longer a spectator sport. Mm-hmm. You have to get involved. It's all hands on deck. So then you would be, you, whether you're vegan or not, you would be advocating that we move to plant-based diets, that we include, become this ahimsa species where we, we show kindness and compassion. 
to all the species, right? And not mm-hmm. just our own species, which is kind of a low bar to set, isn't it? I mean, a lot of people, right. we definitely made uh, improvements, right? I mean, right. there are way less racist people around than right. there were a hundred years ago, etc. But we're still only focusing on one species and with one one simple shift, you can go from one species to millions of species, right? And it's right. it's a, yeah, a, a much better way for us to, to live and um, it'll probably treat us, the karma will come back, right, and help us. Right. Right. Um, Silas, I, I thank you so much for your time today, man. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Um, it could go on for another few hours, but I'm sure you'll probably <laughs> get in, uh, it's probably late. Are you in Phoenix right now? Right, I am in Phoenix. Right, okay, so it's probably getting uh, seven o'clock, is it, in the evening? Right. But thank you so much for your time. I've uh, really, really uh, enjoyed talking to you, and I I will try and spread this word as much as I can. I, I'll, I've got those PowerPoints. I'll try and give those talks as much as I can as well. And uh, I wish you the best of luck and thank you for all your efforts on behalf of the planet uh, and all its um, inhabitants. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for what you're doing as well. You know, you are the storytellers. You know, and you. I'm looking forward to your article in Common Dreams. And uh, um, let's, let's spread the word. Mm-hmm.